from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Hell Creek by Carl Edward Wagner It had been raining for at least three days, he'd lost count, and Adrian Becker wanted nothing more than a warm, dry place to lie down, maybe then a hot meal and a mouthful of whiskey. It was the fourth year of the war, and after Grant's crushing defeat at Chattanooga in the winter of 1863, and England's subsequent breaking of the northern blockade to supply the South with needed material, it seemed likely that the war would drag on for another four bloody years. Becker, not yet twenty, had already killed more men than he could remember, and he knew that the time for killing had only begun. There was light ahead through the darkness and drizzle, and Becker rode wearily toward it. Smoke was on the air and with it the stench of hog pens. He was somewhere in the mountains between Tennessee and North Carolina, dangerous for a Confederate soldier despite the South's new hold over this embattled territory. But the chinked logged in on the bluff above the swollen river promised warm shelter for the night, and Becker was not disinclined to kill for le far less. He tethered his bay horse where the porch overhand kept back most of the downpour from the hitching rail. He shook the dampness from his gray cavalry hat and unbuttoned his gray woolen coat. Beneath it he carried two braces of thirty-six Colt Navy revolvers, two holstered at his belt, two beneath his shoulders, and he hoped the powder would be dry in one of them when needed. If not, there remained his saber, razor honed and oiled with Yankee blood. Quantrill did not train his raiders for parade drill. The latch was out, and hearing other voices within, Becker let himself in. There was a large common room, a good fire on the hearth, some rough tables and a bar. A drover's inn, Becker guessed. A few guests were seated close by the fire. A young girl in homespun eyed him boldly from beside the bar. Becker touched his hat and muttered a general good evening. Aware of their scrutiny, he crossed to the bar and asked for a whiskey. The barman poured. Becker drank. He sighed and put down his glass. Are you the innkeeper, he asked, trying to minimize his German accent. This is my place, said the barman, a heavy-set man, almost as tall as Becker. His eyes were wary above a broken nose and bristling black beard. My name's Culpepper. Becker signaled for another whiskey. I seek food and lodging for the night, Mr. Culpepper. Can you accommodate me? How do you intend to pay? Culpepper had no liking for Confederate paper. In silver? Theirs were coins in Becker's hand almost before the innkeeper saw him reach for them. A gap-toothed smile flashed through Culpepper's beard. Reckon then we got a room that will suit you. You can stable your horse around back. Kate's got venison stew on the cook stove. Excellent, said Becker, as is this whiskey. Culpepper's have been here making it in these hills three generations, the innkeeper said with a note of pride. Here's another on me. Becker moved to the fire and found the place to hang his sodden greatcoat. The fire and the whiskey warmed him, reminded him how tired he was. He could smell the stew from the kitchen close by. A steep flight of stairs invited him toward a room and dry bed upstairs. But first he must see to his horse. When he returned, Kate showed him to his room. There was a fire in a washstand, some rough sticks of furniture and a posted bed with a corn shuck mattress far better than Becker had dared hope for. Kate lingered as he began to wash up. She was a well-turned woman of about twenty with rich black hair piled loosely above a round face with sparkling dark eyes and a ready smile. Becker smelled her lilac perfume as she watched him from the doorway. I'm Kate. Becker. 
Captain Agent Becker. He almost clicked his heels, but four years with Quantrill had delayed some of the reflexes. Nonetheless, he bent over her hand. Her nails were dirty. You're a Dutchman, ain't you? Prussian. I could tell by your accent. We get a Dutchman come through here time to time. How long you been fighting for the South? I've served under General Quantrill's command for four years now. Kate stared at him as he bent over the washstand. You must have started killing Yankees mighty young. I learned such things quickly. Adrian Becker was not yet twenty years of age, but the war had aged him beyond his years. He was tall, just over six feet, broad-shouldered and hard-muscled, and he carried himself with a distinct military bearing that Kate found irresistibly dashing. He had longish blonde hair, blonde mustache, and a few days' growth of blonde beard. Beneath the stubble and dirt, Kate thought his face was handsome, aristocratic in its aloofness, and she envisioned him in dress uniform, escorting her onto the dance floor. She exquisite in silk and hoop skirt and glittering jewels, the envy of every woman at the ball. His eyes were a sort of faded blue, almost gray, and there was a certain disturbing coldness in their gaze. Kate imagined that she could make them flash with passion. Altogether it was a pity that he would be dead before morning. I'll see to getting you your dinner ready, she smiled. Don't you be too long in coming down. Becker sopped up the last smear of gravy with a hunk of cornbread, washed it down with strong coffee, now in better supplies since the Royal Navy had joined with Confederate ironclads to break the Yankee blockade. The stew was good. Venison probably some pork with unidentifiable bits of game. The thick spicy gravy made it hard to tell, and Becker had missed too many meals to be an epicure just now. Some pie, Captain? Kate bent low as she cleared away the bowl. Apple? Yes, thank you, and some more coffee. I find myself growing sleepy after your very excellent meal. Kate rewarded him with a smile, and her father carried over glasses and a jug. Join me in a drink, Captain. Yes, thank you. You are very hospitable. The war is kind of passed us by here, Culpepper poured. Not often we have officers as our guests. Kate said you was riding with General Quantrill. Last we heard tell, he and his army was garrisoned near Memphis. He is, Becker knew, to be on his guard for spies. But this was information to be read in months old newspapers. Of the dispatch papers he was carrying to General Lee from Quantrill, he would say nothing. Becker continued. The Mississippi River is now a Confederate lake, he smiled, but his host had no appreciation of the illusion, while well, he hadn't really expected him to. Likely this whole valley below here is going to be a lake by morning, commented one of the drovers from beside the fire. Creek's been at full blood two days now and rising. Ain't no way we can ford our hogs cross till the water's down. Mass is scant this year, and I just hope we can keep them fed. Hogs get real mean when they're hungry. I saw the rising water, said Becker. What is the name of this creek? He had merely followed the rain-washed drover's trail for most of the day, assuming that it would eventually lead him across the mountains and into western North Carolina, whence he might board a train to Richmond assuming Sherman's guerrilla raiders hadn't blown the trestles east of the Appalachians as well. Why? This is Hill Creek, the drover seemed aghast that a Confederate captain could be so ignorant. Runs into the lower river, maybe ten miles from here. Only, now they call it Hell Creek, said his companion at the fire, another drover, hunched over with too many years to be following the mountain trails. But there was an insatiable market for hogs, just as the war stole away young men and fit enough to drive them from farmyard to slaughterhouse. Hell Creek? Becker paused with his glass to his lips. The Hell Creek Massacre? So you boys heard about that out west? The old drover smacked his lips and gazed thirstily at the whiskey jug. I'll bet you don't know the whole story. Not likely to have heard it from a man who was there. Becker was intrigued. Mr. Culpepper, classes please for my so informative friends. I enjoy hearing a good tale on such a night as this. Culpepper flashed a scowl. 
almost too quick to catch. But Becker was very fast, and smiled and remembered his duties as tavern keeper. The two drovers pulled their chairs over to Becker. Kate brought dried apple pie and coffee to his table. Becker applied himself to pie, coffee, and corn whiskey as he listened. "'My name's Zachariah Warren,' said the older man, gray-bearded, skin-weathered and calloused, face shadowed by slouch hair, well the far side of sixty. "'This here's my boy Ephraim, his boy probably about fifty, heavy-set, slightly less gray in his beard, same worn and dirty work clothes and muddy boots. Becker noted that the old man carried a bowie knife. The younger man packed the a walker colt about his thick middle. The inn's few other guests had by now retired, over half listening to Zachariah Warren's tale. Outside the rain hammered at the walls, four sudden gouts of smoke down the chimney, sucked it back again, greedy for its warmth. Not far below, Hell's Creek's raging flood ripped away at its banks, hurling rocks and chunks of earth into the torrent. They was, began Zacharias Warren, back in April of 63, a Yankee raiding party that rode through here, regulars, commanded by a Colonel Hayes. There was nothing but a pack of thieves, stealing horses, livestock, meal, anything they could make away with. Most of the young men were off to war, on one side or the other. Colonel Hayes' boys was free to do what they wanted, and it didn't much matter to them whether you was Reb or Yank. Now, there was a settlement on Hill Creek, not more than a few houses, a church, a general store, and tavern, a mill, and a blacksmith's and stable. The place was also named Hill Creek, and it had been there since white men first came across these mountains, and the town and the creek was both named for a fur trader named of Hill, who built a station there. Now, I had started into Hill Creek that morning to get to the mule's shoe tended to, and I was just about to come down out of the trees when I could see that Hayes and them was there ahead of me. Knowing they'd take my mule, I hung back to watch until they rode on. Zachariah Warren paused to sip his whiskey. He seemed to shrink back within his chair under the weight of remembering. Well, sir, they was a shot, and Colonel Hayes tumbled off of his saddle and was dead where he fell, and I never could say where the shot had come from. Now Hayes had a lieutenant named Hyatt, and he took command, and he had his men fan out through the town, and then they searched the buildings there, and they rounded up all the folks they could find in Hill Creek, and they herded them together in the middle. There was twenty-seven of them, grown men, women, children, and babes in arms. Who killed Colonel Hayes? Lieutenant, he asked of them all, and not a man would own up. Then his whole town is guilty of murder and treason, declares the lieutenant, and I sentence this town to death. So, then they commenced to open fire, and afterward they moved through the bodies with their bayonets, and the screaming of them women and the crying of their children is a memory there ain't enough whiskey in Tennessee to make me forget. And through it all, and I knowed he'd been shot a dozen times or more old preacher wells a bull of a man kept a shotin i'll see you all on the road to hell and i could hear him back in the trees until they pinned him to the dirt with a bayonet through his heart zachariah helped himself to another drink shaking his head they was almost just women and children and then they just rode away asked becker who had seen as bad along the kansas missouri border only after they'd looted the town and set everything ablaze. Left the dead just lying there, ashes drifting down like snowflakes to cover them. I crept down there finally, but there was nothing any man could do. Zachariah shuddered, and his son mumbled some assurances to him. Becker reflected that there were too many such aspects of war never discussed in military training. Well, they didn't get far. There was a militia regiment come over from Tennessee under a Colonel Macaulay, where they had word of the Yankee Raiders, and boys wasn't far enough away not to see the smoke arising from Hill Creek. Colonel Macaulay brought them up fast. Now Hill Creek was high with the spring rains, so there was just a few places where men and wagons could find safe fort. And when the Yankees started to come across after burning Hill Creek, Macaulay and his militia was waiting on both banks, and they pure cut them down. 
them as didn't fall in the first volleys tried to surrender, and they just shot him dead with a the rest. Them as wasn't washed away in Hill Creek, they dug a shallow trench far along the bottom and buried them all there without a prayer or marker. Afterward, they buried the dead of Hill Creek out behind the burn church. And that's the story of the Hell Creek Massacre, told by the only man who'd seen it all and lived to tell. Beggar passed around the jug. It emptied. The fire fell to embers and it was time for bed. In her room, Kate Culpepper spoke quietly with her father. I saw it while he was washing up. It's a thick money belt under his shirt. That's where he's carrying them Yankee silver dollars and most likely gold as well. You reckon he stole it? Rebel captain riding alone, surmised Culpepper, fingering his beard. He's got shit of that uniform if he'd stole it. Said he'd come from Quantrill, was likely carrying dispatch papers and travel money enough to pay double for room and whiskey. Never blink an eye. He finished that pie? Just a bite or two. It was listening to that old drover tell about the massacre on Hill Creek that put him off his feet. The drover claimed he had seen it happen. He's been walking too many years through too much pig shit. Never you mind. Tired as he is and that much whiskey, Captain won't likely be on his guard. You go to him now and you know what to do. Kate hiked up her skirts to show the straight razor stuck beneath a beribboned garter. Won't be no different this time. Culpepper grinned. I'll be in the hall with a scatter gun if you need me. Looks like stew again tomorrow. Hill Creek was in flood high over its banks. Rain sliced down from the night sky. In the flooded creek bottom, soil rapidly was being ripped away by the torrent. Rotting flesh saw the night once again. Cursed flesh began to stir began to walk, already it hungered for the living. Kate Culpepper had not removed her corset before throwing a robe about her bare shoulders. A simple, can you unlace me, had often been enough distraction to some eager traveler, and when she turned to kiss him, the razor was there in her hand and then across his throat. Kate's main concerns were for the blood on her camisole, or far worse, on the bedding if the poor fool was asleep. She hated washing up, even with the formula her harp ancestors had passed down for removing bloodstains. She wasn't surprised after some experience in such things, but neither would she pleased upon slipping into the death room to find a pistol leveled inches from her face. Adrian Becker was fully clothed, fully awake, and there was a light of madness dancing in his eyes. Perhaps it was a trick of the candle and the raging storm. I I thought you might want something before you turn in, Kate smiled and fell into her practical routine. Sure gets lonely up here. Becker moved away and allowed her to enter. He was amusing himself by tracking her left breast with his revolver barrel. The colt held left-handed casually at his waist. When he wanted, Becker could place six leaden balls through her heart in less than the space she might have lived to draw breath. Laudanum has a scent no soldier forgets, Becker said, shaking his head. And an apple pie without cinnamon? Such scent. You mean taste? Kate had given up on the razor. Now it was to be her wits until her father came in. No, scent is correct, I think odor? It is from the tincture substance, perhaps. Had the pie been warmer, it might have evaporated. I always flavor the pie with some of Father's whiskey. It helps the dried apples. And now, Captain, I'll await your apology. Kate powdered prettily and let her robe slide a bit more from her shoulders. These mountains are rotten with Yankee sympathizers, muttered Becker, but I think you do not care whom you rob and kill. He was peering through the windows into the rain-swept night. Kate started to slide toward the door, but Becker's gun did not waver in aim, and she sensed that his trigger was quicker than her feet. Go sit on the bed, please, Becker said, still not appearing to watch her. I have not yet decided to kill you. You will answer to my father for this, 
Kate did as she was told, giving a flounce of her petticoats as she sat. Her hand fell close beside the straight razor. I knew such a place as this in Kansas, Becker told her, still watching at the window. After they took the money and stripped the bodies, they fed them to the hogs. Hogs, don't you know, will eat everything. They even eat the skulls. No white, white bones to wash about and roll down Hill Creek, my lovely Lorelei. Kate hiked her petticoats towards her knees. I don't know what you're talking about. You are drunk. I'm going to my room now. In the stable, horses began to scream. A burst of lightning flared across the clearing. Shapes were moving toward the tower. Soldiers, Becker hissed, your Yankee friends are coming. You're mad, Kate palmed her razor as she leapt up to join him at the window. What she saw outside made her forget Becker. They were only visible in the long burst of lightning. They shuffled stiffly toward the inn, rain sluicing away the mud from their sodden blue uniforms, rinsing the maggots from their rotting flesh. No weapons, observed Becker. They carry no weapons. They're all of them dead men, Kate screamed. It's Colonel Hayes and his riders come back for revenge. They look to be very solid for ghosts, Becker scoffed. I think they were camped near here and were caught in a flash flood. Preacher Wells cursed them, Kate moaned. Now their graves can't hold them. They're walking down the road to hell. Becker examined his pistols. Alive or dead, they are nonetheless damn Yankees. I think they're looking for me. I tell you, they're walking dead men. Then I'll have to shoot them all the same. You can't kill the dead. I can certainly try. From downstairs resounded heavy blows against the door. Glass shattered, as shutters banged. Hoarse shouts echoed from below. Some drovers had remained by the fire. Someone fired a pistol and another. Time to kill, said Becker. You go out the door first. I don't like razors. The pistol in his left hand was leveled at her head. Kate pushed open the door, moving as if in a dream, a nightmare. Culpepper was waiting on the balcony outside the door at the head of the stairway. He had a shotgun in his hands, pointed toward Becker, but he was looking in genuine horror at the scene below. As he turned his head, Becker shot him through the heart twice. The shotgun went off. Kate clutched her middle where her corset used to be and doubled over. Culpepper tumbled on down the stairs. Kate rolled about, making gobbling sounds. Becker stepped over them both. The Yankees had broken down the barred door of the inn. A number of drovers had bedded down in the common room. They were on their feet now. Those with guns were firing wildly at the shambling creatures from the grave. Becker emptied his cult into the nearest dead thing. The 36 caliber lead balls punched into decaying flesh with no discernible effect. The creature shuffled toward Becker. Becker drew a second revolver and emptied it into the rotting face. Bits of bone and maggot riddled brain exploded as the hammering barrage burst through the back of its skull. With half of its head blown away, the dead soldier swayed and continued toward Becker. At least they were slow. Becker leapt back from the rotting fingers and vaulted up the stairs. The creature sprawled across the corpse of Culpepper, its smashed jaws champing at the innkeeper's bloody chest. Another dead thing was already stumbling toward the stairway. Kate's body was still twitching as Becker stepped past her. Kate, I apologize. He wasn't sure she would hear him. You were indeed right. Becker lunged into his room and grabbed his cavalry saber. The razor honed blade glinted as it came away from its scabbard. Becker drew another colt with his right hand, then rushed back into the balcony. He would have liked to reload, but there was little time for that and apparently little purpose. Becker skidded at the doorway as Ephraim Warren's big walker colt fired past him down the balcony. The heavy forty-four slug knocked back the dead thing that had buried its face in Kate's ripped open abdomen. Recovering, the creature crawled forward again and dipped in its blood-covered face back into its feast. Zachariah Warren's Sharps rifle let go with a tremendous boom. The fifty caliber slug obliterated the dead soldier's skull, flinging it back along the balcony. Headless, it began again to crawl for Kate's body. Bullets are no good, yelled Becker. Hold your fire! He leapt upon the headless creature, swinging his saber at its arms. 
Under his full strength, the heavy blade chopped through decaying flesh and bone. Armless, the dead man still writhed blindly toward Kate's body. Zachariah gaped. He and his son had been asleep in another room when the attack began. What are they? he shouted. I think they may be Colonel Hay's soldiers come back from the dead. Becker peered over the balcony rail as they joined him. Perhaps there is another explanation. God Almighty, Zachariah pointed. That is Colonel Hayes. The light below was uncertain, but it revealed a scene of madness by yellow firelight and lantern. Twenty or more blue-clad soldiers had pushed into the inn. More were following. Ten or so drawers had been there in the common room. Most of them were down, writhing beneath the clawing hands and tearing teeth of the undead soldiers. A few still fought to get away. Their guns empty, they fought with knives and clubs, all to no avail. Impervious to wounds, the dead things simply closed over them and began their ghastly feast upon still living flesh. An overturned lantern began to spread flame across the floor. The Warren seemed paralyzed, but this was not Becker's first encounter with the supernatural. He had won out before, and he reacted to the horror about him as if it were a regular military problem. We must get through them to the horses, he said. Since they cannot be killed, escape is our only hope. Bullets are useless, but they can be dismembered. Blows can knock them back. Is there another way out? Only the windows. More of the undead were shambling for the stairway. More were filling the doorway below. Then it's the windows, Becker decided. Back into my room. We'll barricade the door and let ourselves down. Becker closed the latch to his room, knowing it wouldn't hold. As the warrants pushed a few bits of furniture against the door, Becker smashed out the window pane with a chair, then knotted a corner of a blanket to the bedpost. Blows were already pounding against the door. Hold on to this, Becker tossed a blanket through the window. Brace your boots into the chinking and it might hold. After that, it's not too long a drop into the mud. We'll make a rush for the stable. The door was pushing open. Not feeling particularly noble, Becker slid down first. To his surprise, the blanket held and he had only about six feet to drop. He landed easily enough on the soft ground and drew his saber. In the lightning, he could see shapes stumbling about the clearing, but they were intent upon the inn's doorway. Flame was licking past the shattered windows. Zachariah clambered down next, his sharps rifle slung over his shoulder. Becker caught him as he let go of the blanket. The knot tore free under Ephraim's weight, and he landed heavily. From above came the sounds of crashing furniture as the door burst inward. Ephraim groaned and staggered to his feet, limping badly. Let's go, Becker ordered. I can't run, Ephraim moaned. And I can't wait, Becker said. He started for the stable. The Warren struggled to keep up. Already the dead creatures were closing in on them. The stench of their rotting corpses overwhelmed the miasma of the hog pens. Becker's sabers slashed, driving through maggot-covered arms that reached for him through the darkness. Behind him, Ephraim Walker's call boomed several times. And then, Becker heard screams. An instant later, Zachariah was running beside him, swinging his bowie knife and butchering blows. We can't make it, Zachariah gasped. Lightning crackled over the clearing, giving view to the encircling army of the dead. And we can reach the horses, Becker yelled through the glare. Oh, God Almighty, Colonel Hayes himself, Zachariah shouted as the thunder hit. Another blast of lightning matched the growing blaze of the burning inn. A huge man, dressed in dirt-matted homespun, black beard flaring with a lightning blast, stood at the gate of the hog pens. That's Preacher Wells, Zachariah screamed. Worms crawled about his face, but Wells could somehow still cry out. This is the road to hell, Colonel Hayes, and he opened the gate. Two hundred or more half-starved, half-wild hogs, ravenous at the stench of rotting meat, burst over and past him in a feeding frenzy. Hungry tusks ripped into rotting flesh. Huge, two hundred to three hundred pound barrel-like bodies smashed into staggering legs, bowling over the undead creatures. Eager tusks ripped into declaying bellies, snouts rooted hungrily into maggot-stuffed entrails. The roof of the inn let go in a geyser of flames, giving hellish illuminations to a nightmare from hell. 
The horses, Becker shouted, and he pushed Zachariah toward the stable. They rode until dawn, until the stench of death and the smoke of the burning inn had cleared from their nostrils, moving as fast as they dared along the trail beside the river. At first light they paused to rest the horses. Becker stretched wearily. He eyed Zachariah's sharps rifle. They attacked the inn for some reason, and you were witness to the Hell Creek Massacre. I think it was you who shot Colonel Hayes, from the edge of the woods, with a rifle." Zachariah's eyes narrowed. So what if I did? So many people died, said Becker, and you nearly got me killed. As Zachariah went for his bowie knife, Becker shot him three or four times. Then he left his dead ass there, by the side of the road.